Hello, my name is Christian Gohl and I'm working for SUSE and I will talk about uh, Werewolf, um, which is a tool for deploying high-performance clusters. So for high-performance computing, which means you are not just deploying one node or ten nodes, it's more about 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 of nodes. That's what this tool is used. Um, a short introduction, what, where the name comes from, and what is the story behind it. So the name comes from Beowulf clusters, and Beowulf clusters are simply named after old British poem, and they became popular in the 90s, and the idea was at that time, okay, we simply use off-the-shelf hardware, and use not um, like a simple E4068 boxes, and we don't use these very, very expensive um, gray Unix boxes. Werewolf itself, it should be a werewolf, but it was simply a typo, which is today very beneficial because if you know that name, you will only find this project and not anything else. So that's pretty cool. Um, itself, it emerged out of the Chaos Linux project and Werewolf belongs to this project together. And it was really designed to bring Chaos Linux to, uh, to the cluster and Chaos Linux itself then get, got to send us. And so um, now there were several Werewolf versions. We are now at Werewolf, Werewolf version 4, which is a rewrite from Gregory Kurznot. He's also behind um, CIQ and Rocky Linux. Um, and it's a rewrite of Werewolf 3, which was implemented in Perl, and now it's implemented in Go. So the HPC landscape today, we are really at the edge where the Beowulf clusters are the most common thing. That's the old one from 2033. But there you see that for, for at that time, and it didn't really change, the top, from the top five Linux, uh, top Linux high performance machine, um, four of them were this Beowulf architecture. It's really out of the shelf hardware with uh, NVIDIA graphic cards attached to it or an RT graphic cards attached to it. It's nothing really more, only the Fugaku one. It's really, very, very special ARM hardware. Exactly, yeah, and then also they use the, that's a bit special about HPC computing. Uh, they all use a very, very fast interconnect. So now, what's the base component of such a Beowulf cluster? You always have a management node, and then you have compute nodes, and always a separate uh, management network, and you always make sure that your nodes boot per, um, per network and never ever boot per hard disk, so, you do, so that you can really reinstall your system on a very fast base. Optional components are always, you always want to have more compute nodes. That's, that's the most basic thing that people really want. They just always want more compute nodes. They want also most likely a fast network interconnect. They need a central storage and they most likely can always manage their uh, machines with um, IPMI or Redfish or whatever. Now that's a difference between data centers that you really look that your compute nodes are identical and are cattle, so you don't care for them. So you don't want to. Inst you, they really must to be exactly the same. They need, need, really need exactly the same software components, uh, this, the hardware components on it, because if you have parallel jobs, which means you have one compute chart which runs about several compute nodes and one gets out of sync, this could completely desync the simulation and you will see this. Um, HPC compute clusters are always hierarchical organized, so you don't, so you always think before you put them in the server room, how you put them in the server room, how this all things work together. Um, also, what you always want to avoid is to update your compute nodes after booting. Because this would mean um, that a job finds, uh, so a compute job will find a different node if the node would have been updated. And that's, you really don't want. And also, if you would update your compute nodes and just install a simple package, think of a thousand compute nodes hitting anything, it will always be a deny out of service attack because you have so many of them. Um, also, a different thing is that the application itself comes from a central storage. So that means that you don't run the, 
the applications do not come from the hard disk or from the operating system itself because uh, you have them self-compiled. There are extra tools to do that because if you run your cluster and you have your special hardware or you, you, you have your CPUs, you really want to, to um, the compiler to have all optimization flags turned out for this specific architecture. And then you have as, there are as tools like Spark or EasyBuild where you can really tell um, I want now this application built with that compiler and I have this and that options and turn them on. And so it really goes through all and everything and compiles them with that options on. That's also a difference between the data center where you have your applications installed in the operating system. So we don't care for the applications really at that point. Now, what, what does Werewolf really? Um, the components are that the compute nodes, as I said, they boot over the network into a TempFS. Um, you always have to keep in mind that compute nodes in a HPC area, they have at least one, 120 gigabytes of memory. So mem they even have most likely more memory than their built-in hard disk. They are really big machines. So what now Werewolf, then we have for Werewolf, um, a central uh, kind of Werewolf D, uh, uh, so a daemon, and this delivers the kernel, the modules, and the node images to the node from, from which they can boot, and it has it generates node configuration for the nodes individually. Then we have a command line tool, which where you can then manage the node database, and you can also check the different node images or manage them. We also use some external components in Valve, which are the, the DHCPD server, so that they nodes and boot up node the, uh, so that the network boot works correctly. There you can use uh, the DHCP server, the standard one, or also DNS mask. Then you also need a TFTP server for the initial download. You need it because from somewhere the bootloader must come from and the, Pixie bio, uh, the BIOS just can do Pixie. Uh, Pixie can just do TFTP, so you need a TFTP server. And also what Net, uh, Werewolf can um, do for you is um, configure a central NFS and also manage your ETC hosts, which will then give you um, DNS. Now, what we really took care in the Werewolf project is that the central configuration database is really, really simple. It's just a, a simple YAML file, which you should not edit, but you can edit with external tools. This also means you can put a version control on it because it's just a text file. You do not have to dump any database or anything like this. And uh, you can also do an easy backup. And what you see there, you, you see we have the notes, the notes section, but we also have profiles. So in the profile, you could put everything which is identical. And ideally, uh, node itself just takes the different IP addresses it has because, as I talked before, compute nodes in HPC areas often have several network cards, not just one, but really just one for the management network and then one for the fast interconnect and perhaps even one for a special storage network. So that's very, very common that you have to set up several IP addresses at one. Um, yeah, that's it. Now, that's now how do you configure your stuff, we have quite simple comments where you can add nodes, where you can modify nodes, you can list the nodes, and then you see where it all comes from. There you see, okay, it has ID, um, I now here superseded, sub, so I set the comment just for this node, and it does not come from the profile, and for example, for the device, you see this is configured in the profile, whereas, oh, that's cut, cut off, the IP address is farther down. This would not be set in the profile, but for the node individually. Um, what we also can do in Werewolf, we have configuration templates so that you can configure your nodes individually. This is based on the Go templating engine. So variables then are, so you just write the text file, what your configuration file should look like, and then the variables are replaced um, if you have them in the two curly brackets. You can also um, call functions inside the template, so if you have more complex things you want to do there. And then we have, then on boot time, 
we um, generate these overlays, so we generate these overlays, put them on top of the um, container or node image, so that the, these things are then overwritten. That's exactly the thing. And there you see, for example, our ETC issue, where we see, okay, when you boot up the node, then you want to see, oh, it has booted with that container, with that kernel version, and what are the network interfaces I'm, I'm seeing on this node. And yeah, here I added then also a new one that we have greetings from, and there you can then have C, that you can have um, your own tags in your network if you want to configure your things, especially that you can say, okay, greetings here from Nuremberg. Um, that's exactly this. You can also have your own variables in the templates, which means that you can really do write complex configuration things in there, like configure your GPUs or things like this. Yeah. Um, what we also have in the valve configuration, we just have we have the so-called system overlay, which is applied pre-boot, which means this carries all your important information, especially the network setup. You may ask why do you don't why do you don't use um, DHCP for that all? Because the reason for this we must use it for the booting, but for the actual thing, it, the IP address will never ever change. So you don't want DHCP to just do anything there, so this means your network, you just have less jitter on your network. And also you have things like InfiniBand and IP over InfiniBand that you simply can't run the HCP. So if you have to configure them static anyway, you just say we will configure all um, static anyway. Also the um, system overlay carries information about um, which NFS should be mount, with NFS shells should be mounted, and also um, file system mount and file system configuration for the compute nodes. And on, then we also have the runtime overlay, which is updated on a regular basis, which is um, every minute. And so this means this can be secured. So only if the node is, the node is in a proper state, it will get the runtime overlay, and so you can put in secrets there. Also, we say, okay, the users, they should then also define their own overlays for their own configuration needs. They then can put them either in the system overlay or in the runtime overlay. Yeah, now about the security for Merwolf. We have some bold assumptions where we say, okay, you have a private, your network is simply private because most times it's really physically separated from the rest of it. Um, we also say, uh, because and if you worked in HPC and room, you know, there's NFS used all over the place. So if you assume, so there is always assumed that the network is kind of safe. What we now can do, we say, okay, the node and the, the node image and the system overlay do not contain really um, secure, uh, do not really uh, contain sensitive information. Um, whereas the Runtime overlay, um, this could contain sensitive information, so this is protected by the asset tag. So you set an asset tag in the BIOS, and only if you have that asset tag, you, will, uh, you can access the runtime overlay. Um, also, we have additionally, we say, okay, if you download your node image and the system overlay, this must come from a privileged port, so that not any user can download them, so. Um. Now, what's really interesting about Werewolf is that you can, um, that the, the container, uh, that is what in actually is called container, or this node image, that these are complete OS images. They are transported per OCI container, which means you download them really from registry.suse.com or registry.opensuse.com or any other registry. Um, but they are really complete, they have to contain a kernel. And so the thing is you can also not just import one container image, you can have several. So if you do an update of the OS, you just you can keep them both and just play with some nodes and then suddenly you, you can really update it um, very quickly. Um, and this node images is also quite important, are completely independent from your underlying OS. 
So this means, honestly, you can also play around with a tumbleweed if you have want to have a newer kernel, so that's not a problem. So we have, the, we have our SUSE uh, SLE 50 and SP5 and SP6 image on, SUSE, on the registry.suse.com on um, the OpenSUSE registry, we have also Tumbleweed and Leap images. And on the GitHub registry, there is also Open, uh, OpenSUSE Leap images, Rocky Linux, and also Debian images, if you want to check if your software runs better with what, something else, or if you have compatibility issues and want to check them. Now, it's really quite easy to import them. It's just a single comment. Here we have to, you have to provide your credentials, and then you can really download from our registry the latest image. Also, here's an example of how to you import your leap image. And after you have imported your image, you sometimes want to install more software in it, like, for example, the NVIDIA driver, which is not always in our repos. So we simply, or in our, we cannot build the images on our registries. So you would simply um, uh, change root in your, in your image and then update it there. Um, that's now, that's an extra, that's an extra slice. This is now relatively new. This was added that we can also uh, configure the disks um, with Werewolf. This means you have to create, you have to just tell Werewolf how to, also how your disk setup look, should look like, and you have to install Ignition in this container so that on during boot your disks are really configured, formatted, and whatever. That's now the examples of how to add a single partition. Also, a swap is sometimes needed. Now, um, how we do boot with Werewolf. Um, this is now here the, the boot process. Um, most likely, we boot uh, with Pixie. That's the old version because um, this uh, they just used this for Chaos Linux, and so they started. Uh, they will still. They started to implement it with iPixie. We use the Pixie binaries, which are this distribution, and so this means we have to to get this small iPixie binary per TFTP to the node, and from that on we can then it then um, boot the rest. Then goes over HTTP, which is much much faster. The kernel itself is also extracted from the container image, and then we transfer the kernel extra, and then the container image, then the configuration overlay, and then we can boot. The downside of this, it works relatively good, but the downside if we don't have secure boot on it. That's the reason why I have implemented um, also a crop boot, so that we um, extract the crop and shim from the host operating system if the node is not configured. If it's co it was configured, um, we um, extract it from the container, and then you can also have secure boot. But just it works out of the box, which is pretty cool for some people. Yeah, that's exactly the case. That's when uh, one, when the node is configured, you can have secure boot, um, even cross distribution, which means you could also have a secure boot with a Liberty Linux or with any other, or from for, uh, with Tumbleweed. That must, um, but then you, yeah, that's only working if the node is configured correctly. Yeah, now that's the availability. Um, Valve itself is part of SLE since 15 SP5. So we have also, uh, so the, the binary is for running it, and we also have the container image now in the registry. Um, we have a very um, living upstream community, which is mostly organized um, around the GitHub um, page. Um, there's also a Slack channel where you see you will get you see the invite on the uh, on the GitHub page. Um, Werewolf itself is a Rocky Linux Foundation project, and we have following stakeholders, which is SUSE, so we and CIQ, and also Intel and OpenHPC try. So it will be part or is part of OpenHPC. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Are there questions?
I just had a quick technical question. When yeah. you were talking about the OS images being uh, deployed as OCI images, as containers, you'd mentioned changing root into it and then modifying them. If it's an OCI image, can't you just use it in a Docker file? You can use the Docker file for import, but you could also say, okay, I have my own registry and you have your Docker file to, to create them, but that's way too complicated for most of the people because then you always have to rebuild, re-import it. The thing is you want to have to flat, to have it flattened out because this people running HPC clusters are gray beard Linux admins. They don't like containers that much. Okay. I, I'm not surprised to hear that. It just seems like it's missing half the point, which is the ease of use of the tools. But Yeah, the, the, the thing is, it's really easy. The, the, it's much easier not to really build it all on your way if you just can go into it with the minimal, with, so that you have a booting image, which is then when you, you get a booting, the, the image which can boot from the registry, and then you just your parts on top. You could also do it with a Docker file and then import it again, but that's not how people really want to use it. We should talk about this offline. I have some ideas in that space. Hmm? We should talk about this offline. I have some ideas in that space. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> using Docker file is actually a way to quickly um, create an updated uh, container uh, in a reproducible way. So, um, I would think that people will eventually catch on and uh, go that route. And I mean, that's easy to do, easy enough. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility I was looking into. It's just not so, uh, I just can fork myself and work and do things in parallel. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned Secure Boot. Uh, what would you say? Uh, uh, is it causing more problems or does it have benefits that outweigh the problems? I would say from my point of view it has some benefits but at a given time you want to access your parallel file system and then you have to load a kernel module which is self-compiled and then you have to turn secure boot off anyway. That's the bit downside of it. It's a good checkpoint to have to say, okay, we can secure boot, but I think in in the real world you have you have your parallel file system and perhaps you also want to compile your NVIDIA comp your NVIDIA driver for yourself because you want how, you want this special version which has a magic working on it. So most people will most likely turn it off. But uh, it, it's really running, so it's just out running out of the box. Uh, but if, if you have the sheen, you can load any keys into the mock, and then you could load a custom kernel. Yeah, no? you could do that if you have access to the machine. But the thing is to load the, uh, it inside the uh, the BIOS. You have to sh to go over shim, and this requires a console access, which means for thousand nodes, you need a lot of students. Uh, okay. Hmm. Okay, thank you.